Today's episode is sponsored by Moon Pie Guitars. The Know Your Gear Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome to the Know Your Gear Podcast, episode 352. Hopefully everybody's having a great week and uh, ready to talk about guitar stuff uh, and you name it. <laughs> I guess you, I should say you name it. You, you name guitar stuff. Okay. Uh, as always, I want to thank everybody for joining me this Friday. And if you see somebody with a blue name and a wrench, that just means they're a moderator and they can help uh, send me questions and also help you with issues, and maybe answering questions for you as well. Um, if you see somebody in a green name, that just means they're a channel member. Channel members and patrons support the podcast and they have for 352 episodes. I want to thank them for that. And also, I want to thank, uh, I just saw it. It's just disappeared. Oh, there it is. Uh, Randy Crooks uh, just became a channel member for 27 months. That's crazy. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I think it just means it's going to be for 27 months. So thank you for that. I have no idea. I, I, uh, I'm not sure how, how the memberships work in, in the grand scheme of things, but I just know that you're a member now and I appreciate that and it supports the channel for sure. Okay. Let's get into it. We have so many things that came up this week and so many early riser questions and things like that. So let's get into some of the easy stuff, shall we, while you guys, and uh, real quick, if you guys want a question towards me or subject towards me, please put a question mark at the beginning of it. Uh, it's how I identify you when I'm scanning those. And then sometimes if I can't see one real fast, I just grab the super chats that I see because they're colorful and bright. I'm just looking for cool topics and things to talk about. Remember, you're, you're the guests on the show. It's your subjects, your questions, your thoughts. Chris Skinner had a question and thought his was, Hey, Phil, do you still have the Duesenberg trim on your SG? If so, do you still like it? If not, what changed your mind? I do have it. It's not on my uh, Sunburst. That video, it's on a Sunburst. I think it's a Tobacco Burst uh, SG. It's currently on a black SG that I have. That black SG will eventually go. And then the plan, I think, is to put it on the, um, uh, what am I going to put it on? So my Firebird. That's what I was thinking about putting on the Firebird. Um, so the answer to your question is I still have it, still love it. It's on the SG. Will it stay? I don't know. I'm thinking about, you know, putting it on another guitar. It's easily installed in, in seconds, and I can try it on the gu guitars as well. Um, so, you know, it's actually funny. Funny, haha, <laughs> was uh, I installed it on that SG and then moved it to a white Gibson V that I bought. And, uh, and uh, I loved it on the Gibson V. To me, it was like Hendrix. It was like the ultimate V, Hendrixy with a little triple arm. And I had it hanging in my front room. And one day, one Saturday, Ralph was here, my buddy, and he's like, man, I really love that, uh, uh, that V. He goes, I think I'm going to get one. And I told him, I said, oh, you can't get one. They're like twice as they were twice what I paid for that now. And he's like, so he was looking online. He's like, oh my goodness. And I said, yeah, I know. I got a smoking deal on it, by the way. And I said, you know what? You can have it for what I paid for it. So he paid me what I paid for it. Um, but I gave him the trim too. Because <laughs> I was like, it's cool. And he's like, yeah, it's so cool. Uh, so I bought it in another trim. And then when I went to put it back on the guitar, I put it on my Black SG. But it'll eventually see its way onto the Firebird. The reason it's not on the Firebird now is because eventually the Firebird, Firebird ed, uh, video will be edited and put out. And and I don't want it on that. You know, I don't want to do it before that. I want to give somebody, you guys, the view of it before that. I guess that's my thought process. You know, like everybody, I'm always messing with stuff. A little bit of tinkering, a little bit. Um, okay. Uh, I have no idea how to say your name. <laughs> so, Sedai, Sedai 32, Sedai 32. I don't know. It's a lot of letters and numbers. Uh, it says, you said recently that you have a PRS Studio. Is it an S2 or a Core? What do you think about it? Um, it's a Core. Uh, let me get it for you. It's in It's in here. Hold on. Hold on. One, one second. I'm super excited. I'm super excited uh, because uh, the closet, I have a, a rack system in my closet full of guitars. And uh, the patrons have seen it. But what's really cool for me is there's a motion light in the closet. So when I go in, the light comes on. I like that because it's on timer, so I don't have to worry about the light being on the guitar too long. So here is my uh, Paul Reed Smith Studio Core in this beautiful finish. I mean, is that not one of the best looking finishes ever? I think I showed it briefly on the, ch on the channel when I first got it. Um, and kind of like the Gretsch, you know, these kind of guitars, you know... Um, I think the only way to say it is like I kind of used to watch Cribs, you know, the MTV Cribs show. And I, what I remember as a kid watching Cribs was everybody had these beautiful mansion houses. And I'm like, how do they get those houses? And then one day it no I noticed none of them seem to live there. 
<laughs> right? They're all like, oh, here's my fridge. I have a packet of ketchup. And they're like, oh, here's the bathroom, I think, because they were always like, well, some of them are faking it, but a lot of them, they were just working all the time. Um, so I've learned now, sadly, like if you want to buy, a, have a nice guitar, I've learned um, you just can't have any time to play it. So it took me forever to finally get this set up. Uh, it came out of the box uh, to me unplayable. Uh, the action was too high and uh, it just wasn't right. And I actually wasn't even sure I liked it. It's uh, It was bright sounding with high action and I, I just was not having a, a good moment with it. And... Um, but since then, I put some time into it, and I, I love it, and it's gorgeous. So that's the guitar. So you go there, you see the blue back. Um, I thought about doing a video, and then what happened was, you know, it took some time with it, like I do. And by the time I go, oh, I'll make a video, uh, PRS sent me a thing saying, we changed it. We don't make them like that anymore. They now make them with plastic tone. This is pre-plastic tone uh, knobs. So you guys know this doesn't have the, the cool new plastic tone. I'm being sarcastic, right? Because I don't know how to take that seriously. But... You know, God love them for, for all the stuff they come up with, right? Like I said, I did review a 24-8 that was amazing. And uh, and uh, I actually like that guitar more than this. And when I say not more, more than this, I don't mean model-wise. I mean like that, that guitar specifically, I liked more than this one. But that was a loner and this is what I paid for. So uh, there was a moment where I was like, well, maybe I'll sell this off and try to buy that one. But I was like, you know, it's just is where it is. So I, I really like it. Um, uh, I really like the guitar. So to answer your question, I really like the, like the guitar. This is probably my last PRS core guitar I'll ever buy. Um, I've now bought uh, a few, and I've been trying to find the one. And, uh, you know, after you churn them a couple of times, they're pretty expensive. So, um, but the this, I mean, come on. I just lost. This is not a 10 top, by the way. So it's a 2023 non 10 top. I just... Remember, oh, wait, by the way, I got to show you. Look at the sides, how they stain the sides. Yeah, it like, almost looks like it's glowing like a neon sign. Kind of remind me of the New Year Gear ne uh, neon sign logo, where it's like blue on the outside. Just so gorgeous. So I'm going to hang that right there out of the way. So that's my guitar. It's very gorgeous. Um, and then for somebody who made a comment before, they're like, hey, are you ever going to take that paper thing off your Gretsch? I did. <laughs> I've been playing the Gretsch. Uh, to be honest, I started playing it today. <laughs> so again, like I said, it's great to own these guitars, uh, but trying to get that time with them when I'm do I have other stuff to do. It's like I'm always playing the guitars that you guys want to see videos of, or the guitars that companies send out. I don't get to spend a lot of time with my actual personal guitars. It's a and it's a trust me, that's not a complaint. It sounds like a complaint. I promise it's not. It's everyone should be so lucky to play guitar every day um, and all day for the most part. Um, okay. Uh, what else? Okay. We had a question that came uh, last week. Uh, Amanda sent me some questions. I, I banked them up and this one came from identifies identifies. I use the safest and cheapest strings. I don't know how to process that. <laughs> okay. I understand what you're saying, but I don't, but okay. Uh, that I can find. They are uh, seven to 38. So he, uh, so they're playing a seven gauge to 38, which is about the smallest strings you can play. Um, pretty tiny. I have a video on those and they were pretty interesting to play. It was like playing, you know, human hair. <laughs> it was like nothing. It says, how can I keep my truss rods from snapping? So um, th that's not a concern. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about that. I know what you're thinking. So, some of you are probably thinking, oh, they have it backwards that the you know bigger strings could break the truss rod of the neck, which is not likely. But also, um, it, in this case, they're probably maybe thinking that without the tension, because the tension is so low that the neck can snap the other way. You're fine. <laughs> you're fine. Uh, at this point, you can do whatever you want. Uh, so there you go. So here you... Um, let's see. Uh, I thought there was music therapy last says I'm still without a PRS. Well, you know, there's some exciting new stuff coming. So maybe music therapy last, this will be the exciting announcement. Um, I can't tell you what it is, obviously. Um, but what I can tell you is it's one of my favorite, uh, most exciting announcements from P Paul Ray Smith guitars. It's not a, Hey, we have a, it, 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 you know, uh, it's not a new SE, I can tell you that. And it's not an expensive core, I can tell you that. What it is, is is it's the company, in my opinion, reacting to the market. Um, they didn't say that, I'm saying that. And the current market is, as we know, it's a, it's a buyer's market. 
And so I think their smart enough company realized that it's a buyer's market and maybe you have to give them a little bit more to get them excited. And so this is not a little bit less for a little bit less money. This is a little bit more for no more money. So pretty, pretty cool news. Um, I have no idea when that happens. I think it's March. I can't remember if it's not in the next couple months. There's another cool announcement too. I'm not going to tell you guys what it is. Somebody sent me a funny email though. Thank you for this because I teased it before. Cause like I said, you know, there's some cool stuff coming from Barnes and Guitar. Somebody goes, is it this backpack for 200 bucks? And I'm like, no, I wouldn't tease you guys that they are coming out with a $200 backpack. <laughs> uh, uh, so let's see. Uh, all right. I don't know why I'm laughing. I just make myself chuckle sometimes. Um, let's see. Uh, and uh, let me hop around. Let's see. Okay, hold on. I'm looking for any sub anything back to. I thought you guys had any questions about s the guitar I just had, the PRS, but I thought I saw something. Maybe I didn't. Okay. Uh, a lot of people just said it's a really sexy guitar. It's really cool. It is. It is beautiful. The blue and gray looks gorgeous. So. And I think I told the story when I got it that I wanted one. I, ever since the 2018 PRS event, I played one when at the event. I fell in love with it, but I wasn't able to buy it for multiple reasons. Besides the fact that I didn't really have the money, uh, it wasn't really uh, for sale. Kind of. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Um, Anthony wants to know, Phil, are you be, will you be reviewing the new Sire L3 P90? Um, I, I have all, all the guitars I think that I'm reviewing throughout March and most of April have been locked in. Uh, I can, and I don't, obviously there's no Sire. So I haven't had anybody from Sire reach out to us. Uh, you know, what I will tell you though, is, uh, thank you so much. Um, Anthony for bringing that up because here's something that's really cool that's happening. Um, when I started the deep dive series, it seemed to uh, be a blessing and a curse. Um, not that I was already having problems for years <laughs> with just the regular way I was doing it. But when the deep dive series started a few years ago, as more of a, like a detailed look at the guitars and kind of like showing you guys, if you get a, you know, a problem with the guitar, let's fix that. Um, I didn't anticipate the reaction from the companies, the way it happened, which is the majority of companies really backed away fast. Um, you know, one company went out as far as to say, why the hell would we ever want to send you a guitar? So you can tell your audience why it's not good. That's just the dumbest thing ever. And, uh, and of course, you know, as you guys know, um, so if you, whether you realize it or not, the majority of the deep dives are, they're not sponsored. Uh, they don't send the guitars. We, we come up with them and, uh, that's fine too, but it means less videos. So the reason I tell you this is, but on the other hand, you guys on the podcast have been fueling some kind of fire out there because, you know, I want to tell you, Michael Kelly reached out and they said, hey, we saw your audience talking about it. Um, I'll just tell you right now. So, you, you know, Monday's video is very exciting. It's SBS guitars, the Steve Brown Sound Guitars. This is a brand that you guys brought up over and over and over on the channel. And uh, that's a giveaway too, by the way. So it's going to be a deep dive and a giveaway. So uh, please make sure you watch it. That's what I'm telling you ahead of time. Sometimes I don't want to tell you guys, but I want to tell you now because you can you can win the guitar. And I'm going to do some cool stuff to it. And you're going to win a cool guitar. And they threw in a case and the whole nine yards. Um, and... Um, so it's cool. Basically, what I'm trying to say is more companies are coming back out of the, the woodwork again and going, okay, I think we get it. Uh, you know, you're, the audience seems to like this is what their takeaway is. They don't get it. I, I'm not saying they say that, but a lot of them I get, I can feel it. <laughs> They're like, I don't, I don't understand. Why are you rubbing the frets? Why are you, <laughs> why are you taking things apart? Um, and, uh, but it's really cool. Uh, so I don't know. I just want to thank you guys. That's all. I'm sorry I went off subject, but I just want to say thank you guys because uh, I can tell you right now, they would have abandoned the channel uh, as a whole, as a, as a percentage wise. The majority of companies would have abandoned working with this channel if it wasn't for you guys keeping it alive. Okay. Uh, so that. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Wanna Beetle says. 
uh, has Dane Electro reached out to you? Don't they have some redesigned models with F holes now? Uh, I'm a NOS model with an a, with an A hole. Okay, that's funny. Uh, yeah, Dane Electro. He sent me the new pedal. Um, Dane Electro. Steve who owns Dane Electro is a, a fan of the channel, and he does send stuff out randomly, as you guys know. And uh, uh, but not not anything with an F hole that I saw. Um, he did send me something, and I'm having trouble because I don't know how to do a video about it. <laughs> so that I'm working on. Uh, I'm, I just don't know how to move forward because it's a little bit out of my wheelhouse, but I'm trying to trying to figure that out. Um, okay, so let's talk about something else. So there's something else that I want to talk about, and uh, this is not this is something that came up. It was brought up by my patrons, and then of course, of course, you guys are always sending me messages through uh, through the uh, Know Your Gear podcast website. Um, all right, let's pull this up. Let's share. This is not, uh, this is a bad idea to talk about it, but I'm going to talk about it. Uh, and I just want to be upfront. Um, so I say this all the time. I feel like we need a, a ticker or something on the wall. How many days, you know, uh, it's been, you know, since the last accident kind of thing. How many days it's been since Gibson is in the news again or out there with some more drama it always seems to be drama and this one came up um because of uh this channel's closeness now of course as you guys know when gibson decided that to petition basically and, I, and again i'm not an attorney so if i'm not using the correct terminology I, I promise you i'm i'm just trying to convey the messaging of the story which is gibson petitions or went uh, pleaded with or whatever you want to call it they went to the courts to basically get uh DiMaggio's trademark removed or quashed or, you know, whatever you call it on the double cream pickups and on the word PAF because uh, he owns the name PAF pickups. Um, and I don't know what has happened with that once transpired. As, my, as far as I know, nothing has transpired yet with that. Um, and I told you guys then, this is the important part, that, um, you know, I have bias. I'm, I'm good friends with Larry DiMaggio. And, but I didn't tell you at the time that I have three friends in this industry, all having some kind of trauma with Gibson. And um, it was really tough for me because uh, as someone, as someone I pride myself on my ethics, I didn't share with each other, you know, each, each you know, that they're all having these problems. I don't think it, 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 it's, it's right. And so this week, something came up that I already knew about. So I'm going to talk about it now. So um, let me share it with you. So you guys all know Zither stands. We've we've done the Know Your Gear limited edition Zither stands. If you guys know Marty Schwartz, he did a limited edition Zither stands. You know Zither makes stands for Gibson. They make stands for uh, Taylor guitars. Um, and so Z Zither guitars uh, has been selling stands uh, not only to Sweetwater, to dealers across uh, the country and around the world, and of course direct to consumer, but they've been selling customized stands to companies like Gibson, where Gibson puts their logo on it, to the, to the tune of six figures, basically, would be my, my guess. Um, and so the other day, what was brought up to me was uh, Gibson announced, let me just show all the stuff. So uh, uh, Gibson announced that uh, they, they're doing this double neck with Jimmy Page. And it seemed to me at that time exciting, exciting news, news but um, Zither posted that basically the stand that you're seeing the guitar in is not the zither stand even though he has made a double neck zither stand with a gibson logo for gibson as you can see in this picture right here in the center this is a stand zither's made for gibson and it was at the gibson garage uh they took this picture personally at gibson and you can see from the comments uh that zither is basically saying publicly like look man this is this is a ripoff of our stand um and I know this is where the confusion, which is why we always talk about this on the channel. It's, it's more of a, a, to clarify. Some of the questions I got was, um, Gibson doesn't even sell a double stand. What's the drama over? Well, the drama is a little bit deeper cut than that. So I'm going to share you a little bit of stuff with you guys. Okay, so let's let's talk about this for a second. So first, I want to show you the zither stand. As you guys know it, because some of you guys have, have bought one. Uh, and not only have you bought one, but you bought one to know your gear logo. So uh, Zither Guitars invented this stand. They they patented it. It's trademarked. And uh, they're very, very successful with it. They have a small shop in Texas. They pay their employees well. They run it like a family. It's it's literally a mom and pop. It's it's Tony and his wife, and, and, they're, and they're good people, and they're just doing a good job making these handmade uh, stands, you know, here in the U.S. 
but the interesting part was, like I said, they were selling them to Gibson. Well, interesting enough that it's not connected to this. I just want to share with you. Um, even though they never really sold any to PRS, PRS made their own stand, as you can see here, okay, for $199. And this is only interesting because PRS Guitar sent me one of these stands to ask me what I thought of it and uh, maybe do a video. I never did the video because I uh, had an issue with it. And the issue was I thought it was pretty heavy because the, the base is cast iron. I'm not kidding. It's, it's heavy. And um, they're made in China. And um, I asked the people at at Paul Reed Smith Guitars, do you know if this is safe for nitrocellulose lacquer, the, the cradle? They said it was, but I have been doing this for so long in this industry, I just don't trust it. Like, I'm just not going to trust my, you know, there's some nags right here. It's a very expensive guitar, this Gretsch. These are some expensive guitars. I've, I've worked really hard to get these guitars. I don't want to put them on the stand. So, you know, I have no reason to doubt the PRS stand. I'm just explaining why I didn't want to, like, I told PRS, I'm like, look, I like the stand. I think you did a good job. And I'm kind of excited for you guys, but I, I prefer the string swing quality cradle that is on the zither. And I like, I, I've tried to knock over my zither and I couldn't. And that's where I'm at. Now, here's what's interesting going back to it. Um, this is what happened. You can see this is the new Gibson stand. Now, to the credit, and I told Tony this, uh, obviously it's a knockoff. Let me see if I can move it around. Can I move it around? Why can't I move it around? Let me go back, guys. I'm sorry. There it is. So you can see. Um, here's one. Okay. Now, a couple things I just want to point out. First of all, and I told Tony as their guitars, or as their stands this too, I have to admit, this is a great idea to make the, the, the base look like a Gibson headstock is just smart. Um, I think it's aesthetically pleasing. However, and to their credit, it says it's handcrafted in Nashville, which is not made in China. And that's important because it's not $200 made in China. It's still American made product, which gives a higher, you know, a labor cost. Um, the interesting thing I was, my concern was like, well, but by shaping the base differently, does that, you know, make it less, uh, more likely to fall over tip because that's part of zither's design is uh you can see that they change the 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 uh, angle so the zither's kind of bends at a different angle so this sounds probably not like a big deal to a lot of you guys <laughs> a lot of you are like okay so gibson made a stand that looks like zither so did prs well that's not what happened and i i actually i actually can't understand what's going on right now and i and I just want to talk about it. And if it gets backlash to me from the Gibson folks, then it gets backlash. But uh, I just feel like we got to talk about it. You know, Gibson's the company that's been out for the last few years, basically since 2019 out there, just threatening everybody with a lawsuit. Hell, as a YouTuber, I, I mean, uh, even they said, hey, don't put painter's tape over our logos because that doesn't mean we can't come after you guys. You know, I mean, they've said crazy things and we've all had to get over it <laughs> and get past it. And I think every time Gibson does something, maybe they turn the next to turn and they're a little bit more cuddly and nice again, but then they're out suing somebody again. The problem I have is, okay, so fine. I get it. You have intellectual properties. You have things that you care about and you have, you have, you have built, it's Gibson. I mean, they're, let's be honest, Gibson Fender are like, they're, they're the Goliaths of the industry and they, they are being the ones knocked off the most. Okay. So I get that. But here's the thing with Zither that's interesting to me. So they were buying Zither stands from Zither. Okay and having their logos uh, put on them and selling them through Sweetwater and other places. And then, of course, now you can see Zither is publicly upset because now they're obviously not buying stands from him. They're making stands that look exactly like his and selling against him. Okay. So you're like, okay, that sounds bad. This is the part that I, I, I don't think I should say, but I'm gonna. Um, I'm friends with people at Gibson. And there's a lot of people at Gibson I like. I'm friends, like I said this before, I'm friends with uh, DiMaggio, which is not involved in this particular thing, but I'm just saying I have a lot of friends in this industry and sometimes those friendships make it tough because, you know, you have two friends that are fighting and it's like, okay, I'm just going to stay out of this. And this particular case is interesting. Gibson actually wanted to buy Zither stands and got into a, a situation to find out as much information about Zither as possible and then knocked him off. That's what happened. So you guys know. And... Maybe, maybe I'm just going to, you know, every time I have these conversations, I end up getting somehow demonetized <laughs> or something flagged. I don't know who the hell knows what the hell, you know, but I just want you guys to know it's not so much to me. These stands, you know, they all look the same. 
And that's an ar argument for the ages about, you know, there's a ton of knockoffs of these as other stands. Uh, when I talk about the quality of them and why I use them, and I remember I, I bought all the ones I own, I bought. <laughs> just like you guys. Um, Zither's never paid me for a video ever. Um, the only relationship I've had financially with him is when we reached out to him and said, can we have some made with our logos? And then of course he cut us in on what we sold because my logo's on it and I'm paid a royalty for my logo. But that's my relationship with him as a financial. Um, the reality is this, I don't know, because I haven't talked to, to him about this, but I would guess What's going on now is Gibson basically, and I can tell because he's pissed and he's publicly about it. Um, and what probably looks to you guys as not very pissed because he's just out there going, hey, what's up with this Gibson? Um, you know, he's kind of a he's, a, he's a good person. So I'm sure he's not going to lose his mind or, you know, publicly over this or lose his cool publicly over this. But it is a very creepy thing to see this come to play. You know, um, I was, I'm very aware of the fact that Gibson had a conversation with DiMargio pickups before they decided to submit that they think his trademark should be uh, dissolved. <laughs> okay. So in other words, when Gibson has intellectual properties, you better not go near them. And if you use a Gibson product, you better not show it. But Gibson now is just going to actively go after anybody who tries to do the same thing. In other words, protect their intellectual properties. And the, 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 the thing that's tough about this, which is why I have to speak to it, is no one can fight these guys because no one's got the legal, they don't got the money. Zither is making sta stands in a town in Texas of 4,000 people, okay? Um, these companies cannot fight them legally, financially. It's not worth losing your business to fight this behemoth to death. But I just had a, 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 another issue with another good friend who has a company who then told me, he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm talking to Gibson about, I, he makes, really nice quality accessories. And he's like, I'm talking to Gibson about having some branded accessories done. And I said, are you sure that's a good idea? I go, what if they knock you off and kick you out? And he goes, I got trademarks and patents. I'll be fine. And uh, I don't think he's going to be fine. I don't know what is going on with all this stuff. And um, and this is the, the trick with this. Um, the, the point of this is, and by the way, again, it's for the tirade. I'm not villainizing anybody. I'm, I'm passionate about this because I don't understand what's going on. Again, if it was, uh, you know, perfect example this week is I did a video with a Michael Kelly guitar and somebody put in the comments and they're like, hey, why do all these guitars look the same? It's just a knockoff of a Gibson. And I'm like, I get that. I get it's all knockoffs. And, I, and I'm not, and I've told you guys many times, I don't really feel that the trademarks are about protecting companies as they are so much about protecting consumers. That's my belief, okay? So as long as you don't think you're buying a Zither stand when you're buying a Gibson stand, if you're buying a Paul Reed Smith, as long as you don't think you're buying a Zither stand, if you're buying a Zither stand and you don't think you're buying a Paul Reed Smith stand, I think you're protected as long as you understand. Um, I think if you're buying a Harley Benton and you don't think you're buying a Gibson, I think you're protected. Um, as long as there's no confusion with the customer, they're not being duped is where I kind of uh, feel that uh, that's the real thing here. But what's interesting is, is it seems to me this could be a scary, scary future where these big companies not only are just going to do whatever they want, so they're going to actively go after anybody that takes what or anything that does anything like theirs, and then they're going to actively take anything that you like or they, they like of yours. If I'm wrong... I will always recant that. And by the way, if anyone at Gibson wants to come on the show and talk about it, I'd love to talk about it. Uh, like I said, I own more Gibsons than any other brand of guitars. That's I, I actually own one more Gibson than I do Fenders. And it's because I love my Gibsons, you know, and this isn't going to make me get rid of my Gibsons. It just makes me doubt what is going on out there in this industry constantly when I just want to talk about guitars every week. And then every fifth week, there's some kind of legal drama that will, comes up because you guys have a question. And I talk about it mostly because I don't understand it. I'm like, I don't know why it's going on. Um, you know, uh, this is a particular case where maybe Gibson, maybe they thought their headstock design on their base was cooler looking. I could definitely see that. Um, I don't know. I don't know. You know, I do know this. Um, in the cases that we're talking about right now, when I say cases, I mean situations, not legal cases. Um, I know that 
the P I know the people that are being affected by this. And I know the people that are being affected by this have talked to Gibson in a positive way. Like, Hey, can we just work together? Why don't we license? Why don't you pay us a royalty? Why don't we build it for you? And I said, how'd that go? And all parties I'm talking to say, and different companies are saying it didn't go well. They either say they didn't get a response here. In fact, so you guys know, um, I just want to point this out in the, in this, this, uh, Instagram post, um, here you have Zither saying the stand is a direct ripoff of the Zither music stands for the company, uh, for a company that hates ripoffs. Why would you do that to a great company? He means Zither stands, of course. Mark Agnesi says here, right here in the, in the black, it says Zither makes the stands for us and puts the logo on them. I'm kind of under the impression that Mark Agnesi doesn't even know that Gibson did this, that Gibson just started making their own version of the Zither stand and selling it. So it's an interesting thing. So, I mean, maybe, which is a weird thing for Mark not to know, considering he's any like the brand management guy, you know, brand awareness person, but maybe he doesn't know. Maybe his decision was made too quickly. Um, so I just hope it, you know, let, let's start here. Instead of, instead of saying, screw these companies and we shouldn't deal with them, it's let's talk about it publicly and let's see if hopefully Maybe it's a big misunderstanding. Maybe, hopefully, I'm, maybe I'd like this so you guys know. Here it is publicly. I'd like Gibson to be pissed at me for talking about this publicly and go talk to the other companies and maybe work something out. It's better for the communities. It's better for your customers. Um, you know why? Because you sell joy. And this isn't joy. This is just a reminder that the world kind of sucks a little bit and money is always going to be paramount. And, you know... As someone who wants to talk about music and play music and talk about guitars, this comes up and it just sucks. So that's what I could tell you guys based on that. So you guys know. Um, and then I see some comments. I'll try to address a few things. Let's see. Uh, yeah, some of you guys are saying this act, uh, seems like a tech company. It does. It has a weird vibe. It does. It has a weird uh, vibe. And and if it was one instance when it was one time, so you guys know, when this came up with DiMaggio, I told you guys, I was like, ah, you know, I, you know, this is what I understand is going on, but I'm going to stay out of it. It was a one-time thing. But to be honest with you, now it's multiple times. I'm like, okay, well, now you have a pattern of anytime this company doesn't like your trademarks or patents, they're just going to do whatever they want. Is how it appears. And if I'm wrong, I would love to be wrong. And please explain it, Gibson. Make a statement about it. Tell me why I'm wrong. Tell me, you know, and help us figure it out and make it better. Uh, uh, the Gatelage, hey, Brad, what's up? He says, I searched for the Zither Stand Design patent. I cannot find one. If you have one uh, that's active and valid, let me, might, that they might have a complaint otherwise. I'm pretty sure, so, you know, it's probably under a trademark is how I think he did it. Um, it might be a trademark. I'd have to ask uh, Zither Stands. Um, so it might not be under a patent of design. The um, the drawing, and again, this is, this is could be, and so you know, this is what I thought I had. This, so you're making a great point. I thought I had was, they might have uh, asked to see his stuff to buy his company and then maybe felt that his, either he was had a lack of patents or trademarks and then again, they're like, well, we don't have to buy them. We can just do it. And the problem I have with that is, you know, I guess that's business. Is that what they always say? Right. That's just business. But, you know, and maybe that's why I'm not rich, because I don't really have that attitude that that's just business, you know. F you, you didn't cross your, you know, cross your dots and T's, you know, and uh, and uh, is not my kind of mindset. Uh, my mindset is they make a good product. It's um, and, and so you guys know, and the the zither stands, um, they're expensive, but they're expensive because they're a small shop. But also, um, they actually give a decent margin to the supply to the to the resellers, right? They they actually built in some margin for these companies to make money because they knew that was a, a thing. People want to make a living. They want to support the customers. So, I understand some of you guys could actually argue and very good, by the way, um, that, <laughs> that, uh, uh, you know, the Gibson just wanted more margin, but there's a pretty good margin in accessories. So, I mean, they could get more by doing it themselves, but 
I don't know. I don't know if it's a lot more. Uh, somebody says Larry DiMarzio should sue Gibson. Well, uh, Alex twenty one twelve um, D- DiMarzio is not being sued by Gibson. Um, so back up. Gibson's not a going after DiMarzio. I said this that one time too. Let's make sure we understand this cl- clearly on the DiMarzio's trademarks. Gibson isn't saying, hey, we're suing DiMarzio. Gibson has petitioned to have those trademarks dissolved because DiMarzio asked Gibson to either stop making and infringing on their trademarks or maybe pay them a royalty or work with them in some other capacity financially wise. And um, I don't know that personal discussion. I didn't talk to Larry about any of that in detail. Like I said, just like Tony, I don't want to know the details of that stuff. I just know, happen to know because I know all the a lot of people from both parties, you know, in discussions we have, you know, while drinking a beer usually. So keep that in mind. Um, that the the end of the conversations ended with this is what happened, right? <laughs> they they said no, and the next thing you know, they were being their his, their trademarks were being petitioned to be dissolved. So, and again, if I'm saying the words, the technical legal terms incorrectly, like I said, I'm not an attorney. Um, this is always, like I say on the show, this isn't, I'm not, um, I'm not a reporter. We're not reporting the news here. We're talking water cooler talk, but responsibly because we're within the industry and even handed as I can be. And so, like I said, I think that, um, what's important is again, you know, we should talk about these things. Uh, because it matters to us because if it all happens later in a couple of years and it all unfolds negatively, you're going to react to it then going, I didn't know that. And if I would have known, I would have done this. So now we know. So hopefully it, it makes, hopefully I hope that Gibson, uh, like I said, I don't want them to hate me, but I hope they hate me and they go and talk to these companies and maybe figure something out. I don't know. Like I said, I just wish we could get back to just talking about how cool a damn Les Paul sounds and not how unique it is and how no one should come near it with looks. I just feel like there should be a better conversation about this if we could do it. I guess I feel a little, uh, I don't know. I don't know what, I'm done talking about it. How about that? Um, So there you go. That's what I know. And uh, so uh, El Duderino says, I have a feeling Zither will find a way to monetize off this. So you guys know, I saw this on his Instagram. Uh, Zither is giving 10% off. There's a 10% code if you go to his Instagram. You, if you buy direct from him, you get 10% off. Um, in solidarity to that, if you do want the Know Your Gear stands that we've been selling for basically $200, we put a discount on them too. Uh, if, if you go to the Blackstock Pickups website, it's just, it's there. It's a discount. I don't know why I'm pointing at this guitar. It's literally the stands right here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, uh, so I put a discount on it as well. So again, if you want to, you know, support him, uh, me personally, so you guys know, I, I don't, uh, I love the Chipson guys. If you guys know the Instagram channel Chipson, uh, I love those guys. They are not only a great cha- a channel, uh, you know, or I guess you don't call it Instagram channel, but great, <laughs> whatever it is. Not only do I love their Instagram, um, but I love them personally. Every time, every conversation I have with them is great. I, you know what, I, I hope they reach out to Zithers uh, and do some kind of thing. I'd love, I would personally buy a Chipson, make authentic again or something like that. You know, I'm not the funny one. They are. Make a funny stand and make a, um, I did, I, I, I think, you know, it'd be hilarious. Has anyone ever seen uh, this? Um, let me show you this. I think this would be great. And uh, let's see. The, the uh, Okay, ready? I'm going to show you this. Uh, For those of you who have seen it, let me share it with you guys. Uh, This is the, if anyone hasn't seen, but the Gibson book, uh, (laughs) the open book headstock. If you've seen the Schechter headstock, it's a reverse right of it, right? To me, it would be hilarious if Zither did a reverse open book headstock like the Schechter headstock. So it's re- so it'll actually interlock with the Gibson one, but just opposite and then put chips in on it and do something funny that that would be a great stand. I would love that. Um, and, uh, and maybe that's, maybe that's where I should have took this this whole time instead of bitching about the whole time. Maybe we should have been looking for the fun in it and the way we can make things better. So like I said, um, you know, I just happen to know the sad part is not only is these companies, small company being knocked off by a big company now that likes to complain anytime anybody knocks them off. Um, Remember, so, so if I wasn't clear on this, Gibson was buying stands from Zithers to the tune of like six figures. This is a lot of income to lose. 
You know what I mean? So not only are you not selling stands to a big company, now you have to compete with that big company because they, and I don't know. Like I said, let, like I said, let me know in the comments what you think. Tell me if I'm off base. Tell me what you think. Tell me if, you know, what you guys think. I, I never seem to know. Um, and I try not to get emotional too much, even though I know parties in this, including, like I said, uh, some of the people I know at Gibson, I, like I said, I, I don't want you to be pissed at all the people at Gibson because some of the people at Gibson are great. So, you know, uh, I love some of the people. I'm almost afraid to say their names because I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to get them in trouble. I don't want there to be a Monday morning meeting going, you talk to Phil. He is blackballed from us. Okay. Um, so uh, let's talk about other stuff. Let's get to guitars. Tyler says, hey, Phil, are you going to try one of the new SE Satin guitars? I did not. I declined that uh, from PRS. PRS reached out to me. If you guys haven't seen it, uh, PRS came out with a new SE Satin uh, CE. So just like the SEC, geez, so many letters, just like the SE CE that, PRS came out with in November that I did a review of and a deep dive on. They have released it as the same guitar made in Indonesia with gig bag, but it's just all mahogany. It's a three piece mahogany body with no, I think it's a no grain filler, no finish on it. It's unfinished mahogany body, no maple cap, of course. And, uh, and it's $4.99. And the issue I had was, uh, I didn't know how I told the guys at PRS. I said, I one, I don't know how to do the same video again. Like, I don't know what the appeal of that is. I just did it. So it's like, hey guys, it's that guitar, but no maple cap and no finish. And it's less. So if you liked what they did with that guitar, you'll probably like this guitar minus those things, right? To me, that's a tone would not tone would debate. If you believe the maple cap and the finish does something to the tone or takes away from the tone, if you believe the open grain does something, then make your decision that way. Otherwise, it's a financially uh, thing. The other reason I also stayed away from that particular one was... Um, like I said, there was, there's three, let's just say three or four new launches coming out in the next few months. And when they ran them by me, uh, you gotta understand, like, just like anybody, they got, there's a lot of YouTubers out there, you know, that can promote things or talk about things and they, they make the best decisions for them. Just like I make the best decisions for me. And so they're not going to want to send me everything that they come out with. So I was more interested in a couple of the other things, you know, and sometimes that's the decisions I have to make. You know, it's like, I'm only going to make so many videos. Like I said, I make 50 videos a year. That's not even one every week, basically for the year. I do 50 podcasts a year, but I do 50 videos a year. So uh, I basically have to pick and choose what products. And one of the things I told you guys, one of my New Year's res resolutions for this year was to get more new brands on the channel. Like Michael Kelly's new brand, uh, SBS is a new brand. Um, so I've been trying to get more new brands on the channel. So it's just not like the you know, same, same stuff. Keep it interesting for me. Keep it interesting for you. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, hold on a second, guys. I'm just looking around reading. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> some of the, <laughs> I'm like reading the question. It's like, who's the greatest guitar company, bar none, and why is it Harley Benton? I just, sorry. I, it's not a question, but it's interesting. So, interesting. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, a lot of you guys are talking about, small business and hey, look we get that that's but what's great now is we do have a platform where everybody gets to check out gear and talk about gear and that's the important part um okay so let's let's take a look let me grab some questions like i said so we can talk about some new subjects new things Okay. Uh, Chris says, Hey, Phil, toothpicks on the LT worked to lower the bridge pickup. So thank you. So last week we talked about he had a direct mount pickup and he needed to lower it. And I said, pull it out, uh, <laughs> pull it out. And then basically, uh, you know, cut the foam down and then put it in. And he did before the show. So think of this while he was listening to us talk, uh, you know, he was, he went back to work and he said, Oh no, the hole got stripped out. And I said, yeah, you can use a toothpick. Um, so he said he did and that worked. Uh, he said, uh, as stainless steel frets need file and crown, uh, waiting on the new file as my crowning, uh, 
crowning has been iffy. So I'm glad it worked out for you, man. Like I said, thank you for for telling us that it worked out. I love it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the whole point of this is to talk and 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 uh, not only see, give it a piece of advice, but also see how that worked out for you and see if it didn't or didn't did or didn't, so we can get feedback. Uh, Parker says, Phil, do you think do you think important artist signature guitars will hold value more? We've talked about this, but I'll briefly talk about it again. Like like the Mike McCready, um, I think it's made in Mexico, Strat, or does that apply to just U.S. signature guitars? I don't think uh, signature guitars apply to just U.S. signature guitars. Look, we know USA, USA made guitars uh, hold value, but that's not a guarantee because there are main USA guitars that just don't hold value, as you know. Um, but artist guitars, I think, are going to always be in the long term uh, going to hold value. And the reason I've said this, and I just kind of feel like a broken record when I talk about this is the artists will always, well, not say always, but for the most part, there will always be, will be new fans of the artist. And at some point, what I've learned is, is either the artist changes their, their vibe and their mind. Um, and, uh, I kind of, I kind of see it, you know, you see it a lot. Like an artist has a guitar, a signature guitar. Everybody loves it. They start buying it. And then the artists, they see everybody having the guitar and they, they, what they loved about the guitar was they were the only one with it. So now everybody has one. So they make a new one <laughs> they make a new one. They're always constantly making a new one that you can't kind of catch up with them. And, uh, I think the main reason for that is to keep it exciting for themselves. But what's going to be interesting to hold value is, is that, those guitars, although whether they did well or bad, you know, when they first came out, like I said, there'll always be new fans. And so there'll always be a market for them. And I've learned this uh, over the years because certain artists' guitars that did not do well um, you, and you couldn't give them away. Now, good luck finding them at, at a good price point. Um, I've talked about the Matt Guitar Murphy guitar from Cork Guitars. You know, um, they didn't make very many of those because, you know, he, he's... He's known, but he wasn't like, you know, he's not out there like Eric Clapton and Eddie Van Halen. And um, I don't even know. Let's look and see if we can find a Mac Guitar Murphy court guitar. And oh, perfect example. Okay, so here's one. I'm going to share it with you guys right here. Oh, I don't want to save the search. I just want to open it. So here's one for $295. Here's one for $475. Uh, oh, I hate it when it drops out of that. Um, but what I was going to say was uh, the important part of this is, um, well, I remember when you couldn't give them away, you know, because, you know, just no one wanted it. And so, like I said, holding value for sure. I bet you, I think that guitar was about that price new. <laughs> when it came out in the early 2000s. So that's a good example. You know, another guitar I think about all the time is um, is uh, PRS, uh, had a, uh, PRS had a uh, a had an SE guitar from the guitar player from 311. And same thing, it was like this Daphne Blue, baby blue guitar. You see them everywhere and they were always super light. They played great, but man, they were always like a deal. And then again, now trying to find them, they are pricey. So I think... Uh, signature guitars, I think, will always end up holding value because, again, it doesn't matter how many they made. If, even if it doesn't do well, it um, it catches up with itself. I guess that's probably, a, I should just say it that way and not go on such a long tirade about it. Uh, then we have Mr. S. Mr. S says, Philip, my friends and I are home uh, players and hobbyists and are in the market for a 5-watt tube amp as a pedal platform for around $400 suggestions. Hope you're uh, your doggo is doing well. He's doing well. We talked about this. My dog has seizures. Uh, he has not, I'm not going to wood. He has not had seizures since the uh, time we had to take him to the, the pet urgent care, uh, which is the right before I did that episode. So it's been pretty good. They, the new meds seem to be working so far. So we're going to stick with that. Um, the uh, So thank you for asking for that. Um, on your note, this is the tough part. I, man, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I, feel, you know what we can do? Let's do this. Okay. Let's, let's do something fun again. I feel like we got to have some fun after my, you know, after the drama tirade, uh, let's do, I'm, I'm going to, I should probably go on reverb, but I'm not going to, cause I want to look at new stuff. Let me go to amps, guitar amps. I don't really care if it's a combo. Do they let me sort by, uh, we'll do combos. 
most popular. We can do it by price point. I wish Sweetwater had like a twenty-five dollars to to four hundred dollars. I'm gonna do three to five hundred dollars just to see. Okay, so let's see what we got here. Um, these are solid state or digital. That's digital, digital. The Infinium, right? That's a twenty-two watt amp. That's tube though. That's a good amp. Four ninety-nine. You wanted four hundred bucks. Oh, because it goes three hundred to five. Oh, but I can sort it by. It doesn't matter. Let's just keep going. $500, $500. I knew it was going to be tough because all the amps that I know, here's a P, P Viper. It's not the same thing. It's not, it's not tube amp. Modeling. Yeah. See, to me, when you're talking that price for a tube amp now, it's going to be all, unfortunately, all the amps I can't help you with. It's like Harley Benton makes some. And I thought that, doesn't Blackstar make a $400 tube amp? They don't make a $400 tube amp? Tube amp? I guess I was looking at combos, but maybe heads? I would have swore. Somebody, does somebody know, right? I would have swore that uh, VHT makes the special six, Hero Glop says. Yeah, that's a good amp. I've actually owned a VHT Hero Six, uh, special six. I had two of them. I had uh, I bought them from a guy on a smoking deal. He had a modded one, unmodded one. I bought them both uh, smoking deal. And I think I like the unmodded one better, I remember, but they were both pretty cool. Um, so, you know, that's tough, right? It's like I'm trying to think, you know, I don't know. Somebody says Joyo. A lot of stuff is like two preamps and not two power amps and stuff. Yeah, it's tricky. Yeah, I don't know. You that's a tough one. That's a that's absolutely but you know what I want to do now? I want to kind of look. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go look and see if maybe that's a, something we can make a video on. You know, I, I did the Laney, uh, which is basically a five watt amp, but it was in the six hundred dollar, five seventy five range. So maybe I can find something else. Uh, clown of house clan clan not clown clan of house cats says I saw the JP fifteen in Majesty and now a JP thirteen. Which one of these are you keeping? New guitar every day. Um, it's not a new guitar every day. You gotta understand this is this is my office and uh, I just play the guitars in here because it's a good backdrop for the podcast and it's a good backdrop for when I'm doing videos. That's kind of the main thing. I've said this before. This wouldn't be like, where I like my guitars is I like them in racks. Um, it's why I changed the, the repair uh, s studio, the repair room, right? Because um, I was making content, but it was not, um, for instance, <laughs> uh, I normally wouldn't hang my guitars. I do hang some. I would normally put them in racks. That's where all my guitars are now. So if you saw me when I got the PRS, that's what I went to is into a room that has racks and they're all sideways in racks, um, which is why it's ever changing in this room because I can pull from the rack and I'll change out things as I'm doing stuff. So um, that's what you're noticing too with the guitars. They're just some guitars are in the racks, some guitars are on the wall. And uh, everybody always thinks the same thing because it's not in physical frame. Um, and remember, I have two, technically three rooms, um, but two studios. I don't call this a studio. I call this my office, but the other room is a studio. And so there's amps and guitars in that room as well. It's, it's how you make content. You know, you have to keep it, uh, you have to have different rooms to keep it efficient. So to answer your question, you're just going to always see stuff change and don't try to make heads or tails of it. <laughs> which is what everybody tries to do. Uh, they always go, oh, this one's not on the wall. It means it's gone. It's in the racks. Uh, like I said, the only thing now, I can grab one from the rack. Um, that's how it's different now with the redesign the room. In fact, it should be another little fun uh, thing to tell for those that watch too much of my content. Um, I've, I've told you guys this. I was per very, not only upfront about it, but I was trying to, to explain it correctly the this is not the room <laughs> that i've been in for years this is a totally different room what's tricky about that is is that we redid the other room and made it look like this room and then we we did the rooms identical because i was so i can do construction in one room and film in the other and then i switched so it's very confusing <laughs> this is what you're trying to say so this room is uh is a different room and but it's made to look like the old room and the old room was uh, slowly modded over time to look like this room so I could, because uh, it took about four months to get both studios built out. Um, somebody said, asked me about doing a tour. I thought about it. Uh, maybe I'll do it. I don't know. 
it's one of those things I always go, I can either do it on Instagram or I can do it to my patrons. I don't know why it would be a video. So I don't know. Maybe it's interesting. I never know if what's interesting or not. <laughs> I find all the YouTube stuff boring because it's my work. It's my work. Uh, I like being around the guitars, but the actual filming and doing stuff is boring. Um, Steve Cassidy guitar says, uh, hello, uncle Phil thoughts on the Gretsch guitars. I love Gretsch guitars. I have uh, two. There's one right there, uh, which is orange <laughs> 6120. And then I have a 6118, uh, 6118 LTV. And, um, they are, and I'll show you. That's what's great. I'll scrap. So So you can see, so I'm talking next to the camera, you can see they're massively different in size. Let me back up here. They look the same, um, but here, if that helps. One, this this one, is a little bit bigger than a Les Paul. Not much, uh, but a little bit bigger. And this is a full size. So you can see they're they're different. And then the, the back of the black one, it looks amazing. <laughs> Everyone who thinks the black one looks boring, but I actually love the black. Um, same scale, same neck, I'm yelling, by the way, but they are smaller are the uh, LT-18 is smaller. So if that helps. Uh, Aussie English says, thoughts on the new Adam Jones Flying V being 40K? Look, I, that's not real to me. <laughs> the Kirk Hammett one is 28. No, <laughs> look, uh, you know, no, I'm not doing it. Uh, I can't. I'm sure there, look, I've said this before. That stuff is investment stuff. You know, um, that's memorabilia at that point. I've talked about this in detail. Um, I don't have, notice I don't go, there's no reason a guitar should be $40,000. Uh, guitars can be $400,000. They can be a million dollars. Who cares? Um, it's, but to me, they slowly start turning into memorabilia, collectibles, um, you know, things like that. They're things that rich people shove their money into, and I've always said this before, and I'll say it again, rich people take their junk to the auction, poor people take it to the dump. And uh, you make fun of it, I understand, but they can take and flip and make more money. That's what they do. That's why they buy art, flip it and make more money. Um, so same thing with these kind of guitars. Yeah, you, you know, you see guys, collectors buy this stuff and flip it just like vintage guitars. It's, uh, see, Mr. Al says it's overpriced firewood. See. Mr. Al, I'm not disagreeing with you, but also remember that it's like when they buy vintage cars. It's like when you hear somebody buying uh, this stupid car that comes out and it's like $200,000 and uh, and they sell it a month later for $300,000. It's like you could sit there and say they're dumb, but they just made a hundred grand, right? Um, I did a video and I, I, I urge everybody because it's instead of a hypothetical Here's a story where you guys got it wrong. You being the whole of the community got it wrong. Um, I will show you the video. It always makes me laugh because I learned a lesson from it. Um, so I had a customer. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Let's see if I can pull it up. Let's see if I can find it. <laughs> Sad thing is I don't know what it was called. Uh, and now I see, I say a lot and I can't find it. Uh, let's see if I can find it this way. So many weird guitars and it was a while back and I'm not finding it. So I'm going to have to do it the hard way, which is go through actually my catalog, but I'm going to do it right now. And I hope you guys play, uh, stay with me because I think there's a, a lesson to be learned here for, um, because there is a lesson to be learned here. So it's about four years ago. I want to say 2017. Does that sound right? Let's take a look back, go back in the way back machine. So what happened was I had a customer, a customer who uh, had uh, had some frets sprout on their guitar and they were stainless steel frets. They went to a local shop and they were given some information that scared them. They were uh, telling them something that basically made them nervous because the guitar was very expensive. Um, and so they, they asked me up and they called me and said, hey, could you, could you take care of this uh, guitar? And I said, yes. So I did the work on the guitar. Okay, uh, so it's a Music Man Petrucci Majesty guitar, and it was like this limited edition one. It had like a diamond in the neck, and it looked like a spaceship. And of course, the majority of the comments in the video is how ugly it is, right? Because it's weird. It's a weird guitar. Um, and uh, and I'm hoping I'm going to find it. 
and then I'll pull it up for you guys. But anyways, why this is uh, an interesting story is they, in the video, I did a, I did a video. I said, Hey, since I have the guitar here, Oh, that's what happened. So, you know, he said when I was working on the guitar, he goes, and if you did a video of the guitar, I wouldn't be hurt. And I said, oh, okay. So I took that as he wanted me to do a video. So I did the video of the guitar because how many times am I going to be around a $10,000, especially back then, $10,000 uh, weird spaceship Petrucci guitar. So I did this video of the guitar and I talked about it. And uh, the comment sections went nuts with how dumb this is, especially then with them thinking of inflation, $10,000 guitar. It's not worth it. Only an idiot would pay that. And, uh, you know, like why, you know, I can't find the video. <laughs> So if somebody finds it, great. Because I can't remember what the, what's called. It's a it's a majesty, but it's like a weird one. So anyways, um, and I, at this point, I, I can't find it. So the the important part of the story is, is after I did the video, everybody said it was dumb. He was dumb. And then he sold it for $12,000. Now, I don't know this to be true. Okay. But I've always gotten the impression that he sold it because everybody said it was dumb. I've had this experience on the channel many times where I've had guitars that were viewers' guitars and I did uh, videos of them. And I, a lot of people think they have thick skin. They really don't know what it's like, right? You get you get tortured. You put yourself on the internet, you're going to get tortured. And um, so a lot of times, you know, uh, I think what happened with him is he decided to sell it. He sold it for $12,000. Now, I know what you're thinking. Ha ha! <laughs> right? Phil's like, oh, you guys said he was dumb for buying it 10 and he sold it for 12. So here's what happened. He bought it for $10,000. He played it for a year, sold it for $12,000. In my mind, he made $2,000 and got to play a guitar for a year for free. That sounds pretty good. Here's what happened though. Within a year from that, it was selling for $25,000. I think that's where they're at now, still $25,000 to $35,000. So he could have made $25,000, but he sold it too soon. And I think he pre got pressure to sell it too soon. So my point is, uh, my point is, is exactly that. I don't buy those kind of guitars. I don't see that kind of logic um, for myself. But I also don't make fun of it because a lot of those guys make a lot of money or can make money because it's a different kind of animal. Like I said, don't, thank you, uh, Eric. He says it was the Nomac. Thank you so much. It was the Nomac. Here you go. Let's see if it pulls it up. There it is. Oh, there's my bald head. Uh, okay, here we go. Let me share that with you. There's the Nomac right there. So there's my bald head. $10,000 John Petrucci Nomac. Uh, got 240,000 views. It was six years ago, like I said. And uh, and like I said, now look up the Nomac uh, and they're, you know, they go for way more. So um, that my point was exactly that, is that... Uh, to go back to the core of that question with this $40,000 guitar, I, I don't know what to tell you because I'm it's not a guitar to me. That's memorabilia. I'm not into buying and flipping memorabilia. If I buy a guitar, it's because I've just I either I've always wanted it. And it's just about having it to, you know, to fill some hole in my soul. <laughs> to bring joy back to a life that has has had a lot of misery. Something like that. It's kind of like the logic. Um, so there you go. And uh, also, um, <laughs> also at this point, um, during COVID, I learned a lot. I bought some guitars that were way out of my comfort zone that I normally spend, and I didn't enjoy it. And so I'm not going to go back. I'm not going to buy those kind of expensive guitars again. So, so I don't know. That helps. Okay, uh, let's do the next question, comment, subject. While I drink some water, that's probably a good idea. Oh, I didn't finish this um, Aussie's question, which was uh, about the Adam Jones and the Kirk Hammond. He says, is Gibson pulling these prices out of their arse? Um, no, uh, they know. You know, here's the deal. They're not pulling it from their, their arse because they're selling through. They know. They calculate, you know. I mean, essentially, that's how it works with any anything like that. You know, um, it's like, hey, if we sell it for a hundred bucks, we'll sell a million. If we sell it for two hundred dollars, we're gonna sell half a million. If we sell three hundred bucks, we're gonna sell a quarter million. And then they kind of figure out, okay, well, where's the best scenario in that? And then they figure it out. Um, so that's that's kind of the logic there. You know what I mean? So, so no, I don't think they pulled it out. I think they, I think they knew, and I think they're, you know, look, there's. There's 
they're a very strategic company, whether I like it or not. As I talked about them earlier, you know, the things they're doing that I don't approve of, I it's again, it's because it's their strategic business. And I just, you know, I, everybody should be able to make money. But I, you know, you also get to choose who you give your money. Uh, Rob says, hey, Phil, why are Fender Custom Shop Gilmore Strats being listed on Reverb for five figures? Did I miss something? Uh, I'm ready to sell mine. Same thing, right? I remember we sold a bunch of those when they came out. A bunch of them. Uh, six or seven, which was a lot for us. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was it was a big deal. And, um, no, it's cool. Uh, they go for more money because of what I told you. It's, again, memorabilia to, to, to somebody. And it's a signature guitar and the rarity of it. So... You know, um, to answer Rob, uh, you know, I said earlier, maybe I misstated something where I said, oh, I don't really buy into that stuff. You know, the memorabilia stuff. That's not true. I do kind of have a couple memorabilia type guitars, one being my Ibanez Gem. Uh, my Ibanez Gem, when I bought it, uh, you know, I, I've told you guys when I bought it, I was into it for like nineteen hundred dollars, uh, basically into it for trade. Right. Uh, my buddy Joe traded it to me. Uh, now, uh, I don't think, well, I know I would never sell it for less than 6,000. Uh, and I don't want to sell it. Um, but it has, um, unfortunately robbed, this is why I said I'm, it's not for me. Uh, it's robbed the joy from me because I don't play it anymore. I don't play it because it's worth $6,000 for sure. And that means because it's worth $6,000 and I did buy it for two, that means one day it'll be worth $10,000. Because what I have is a floral gem in 100% mint condition. It's a case candy guitar. It's a case classic. It has no chips, no dings, no fading, no nothing. And because of my buddy Thor, I have the original Ibanez promotion poster that was in the music store to promote that guitar with Steve I. It's a great, it's like a great package. Like whoever, if there was a collector who wants this, they're going to want this uh, guitar. The problem is I'm not a collector. I bought it because I just wanted a gem and I wanted to play it. And now I find myself never playing. In fact, what I have here is this is my fake gem. This is an Ibanez uh, Prestige in uh, fluorescent yellow. And I play that and I let the gem sit in its case in the, in, and it doesn't even sit in the rack. It sits in the case. And it's because... Although I love it and I want to play it, I also don't want to screw my kids out of six to ten thousand dollars. And so if I die, they could just sell it or something. Or like in your case, when you're saying you're getting, you know, ready to sell it, same thing. If I it gets too stupid at some point, it just has to go, right? It just has to go. And then it's just and again, that it became about money and not about the guitar. And I that bums me out too. So there you go. Uh, Vim69 says, in case you get demonetized for this video, we'll see. Like I said, oh, you, you never know. Um, <laughs> I've been demonetized for a lot less. Okay, so Daniel says, uh, I have been looking at the zither stand for a while, but it was a bit too expensive. It is very expensive, but I'm buying one now. Thank you for the transparent information. Well, I'm sure, look, I know Tony Zither and those guys will appreciate you getting the stand. Um, and I, they are expensive. I've always said it. it's a very luxury, luxury item. And, um, and you know, to speak to that, uh, something else zither is really big zither stands are really big in the orchestra environments that's where they make a lot of their money and, and that's where a lot of this i mean you can imagine people who buy cellos and all these expensive uh, orchestra instruments at, at orchestras want a beautiful piece of furniture you know what i mean to do this to you know put their guitar on right i mean it's just it's a nice piece of wood it's like very modern look and it looks good and and so you know and and uh you know, so us guitar players, we're just not used to like, you know, $200 for a stand, $100 for a stand. But like I said, you could get a zither stand for $100. And I personally think it's for $100, it's worth it. Um, you know, for those of you going to say different things, it's fine. But I mean, there are stands out there that are 50 bucks that are just, you know, aluminum or metal, cheap metal collapsibles for made in China. And so to me, to have a nice piece of furniture in my house uh, that my wife doesn't have a problem if I hang my guitar on in the front room, uh, I like having it. Uh that's funny. There's there's Grumpy Mike's guitars got competition. There's somebody just named Grumpy. So Grumpy says, "Hey, good day, Phil. Love the Michael Kelly guitar video you did. Uh, looked at one today in Australia. Uh, found new, eight ninety nine, free delivery from the store. I was thinking I'll make a dive at it. Yeah, it's good. That's good to know because I thought you were gonna say it was five million dollars every time. Else, anybody from Australia is like, 
In the USA, it's three hundred dollars. So here, that's like four hundred eighty thousand dollars. So that's cool, eight ninety nine. So very cool. Like I said, um, it, it's a lot of guitar for the money. So I, I like guitars. I like doing videos like that. I like doing videos where instead of explaining. Um, you know, this is how they made it cheaper. This is how they made it cheaper. It's like, look, this is what they did. They didn't really compromise too much. And then they just made the prices, you know, as reasonable. Today, there's no such thing as cheap. It's just more reasonable than something else. Uh, Grumpy My Guitar says, um, uh, looking at a Michael Kelly Mod Shop Patriot just because it's pickups. Yeah, because they do uh, uh, bare knuckles too as well. I just need a bad influence to put <laughs> I just need some bad influence to push me over the edge. Um, you know, um, Grumpy Mike, uh, you know the saying on the channel, right? If you ask if you should buy a guitar, you should. <laughs> so I, I don't know. You're not gonna. You're right. You're not gonna get any good influence here. Uh, Bit Matt says, "Happy Friday. I uh, love what you do. Looking for a non-tube ideas to run a 212 cabinet for practice." Um, well, you know, there's the there's the um, katana head. That's a non-tube. That's a really good amp that that I like. Uh, that's non-tube, something like that to run. And it'll run a 212 cabinet, absolutely fine. I really like that amp. I I like the catalyst a little bit more than the katana, but the catalyst doesn't make a head. I kind of wish the catalyst would make a head. You know, uh, I find uh, I've, I've said this before. I really like katana stuff, but for some reason, and just everybody's different. Um, I like. Line six distortions slightly better than boss distortions. Some people are going to be the opposite of that. It's fine. It's not, I didn't notice, I didn't say they're better. I said I like them more. That's very reasonable. Uh, uh, PW uh, says a uh, quilter. Quilter is another great choice too. It's really cool for sure. Uh, I've uh, done quilter before and good stuff. Okay. Hold on a second. <laughs> I think uh, Grumpy My Guitar, everybody's saying you should buy a guitar. Uh, Redbeard uh, wants to know, I think you're talking about the zither stands because you just said stands. He says, are these stands safe for nitro finish? They are. So, so you know, I only use, just to keep things easy, I only use string swing stands. And I say only because I, it's not 100% true. I have a small fold-up little stand for travel because a string swing doesn't make a little fold-up stand. Um, so I only use string swing uh, hangers, which is what's there, which is where I found the zither stand. I was, I saw him at the bottom at the basement at the NAMM show and he was doing this spill where he was trying to knock over his guitar. Like I am right. You know, this beautiful PRS, he was doing stuff like that. And I, me and Ralph were walking, we go, I thought that was weird. <laughs> and then, um, and then we're like, what is he doing? This is weird. And he's like, yeah, try and knock over the guitar. And we're like, what? And the first thing I took notice to was that it was a uh, an actual string swing neck cradle. So he's using, it's the same neck cradle, um, which is what I use for a thousand reasons. Um, and uh, after the show, uh, I went on, I think it was Amazon or something, and I bought two zither stands for $99 each. Uh, cause that was the cheapest ones I had. And I thought, Oh, two, one for each room. And then, um, I got them. And then of course I'm like, Oh, I should make a video cause clickbait. Cause I was like, actually, that's all I was looking for. I was like, oh, I like it. It's a good stand. It'll make a good video. Cause I'll knock around guitars on it. And I did the video. And of course the video did really well. And he saw the video and then he reached out to me and he's like, Hey, thank you. I'd like to send you some stands. And, uh, he sent me a stand, which is very kind of him, but I already had the ones I bought. <laughs> And uh, he's like, hey, uh, he, you know, hey, if you ever want to work together on some content and stuff. But at that point, I already done the video and I already had stands. I didn't know what we would do together. And I thought it was a couple years later or something. It was during COVID when I said, hey, um, uh, in fact, actually, you know what it was? You got a lot of you remember during COVID, I was thought it would be cool to do each quarter a limited edition Know Your Gear piece of product. And it would go a great way to, you know, get revenue for the channel and do stuff. And basically, it blew me off but him. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, 
Matt says, hey, Phil, uh, selling a lot of gear to build a small fractal rack. What are your thoughts on the FR, FR speaker versus power amp? I like the power stage and cab. I, I've tried all, well, I haven't tried them all. I've tried a lot of FR, FR cabinets. I've owned a bunch and I just never fell in love with any of them. Um, I guess if I was going to say my favorite one was probably the Line 6 one, but I just never fell in love with them. So um, for me, I know that's the 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 thing, right? To take your modeling or your profiling tech and run it through FR, FR. I don't know what it is. I just didn't didn't do anything for me. So I, like I said, I personally just run a powered uh, Kemper and I run that into a rec actual regular regular guitar cabinet, and I'm super happy. And um, and that's that's it. That's how I do it. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, uh, okay, hold on a second. All righty, let me go back because I think we're almost, we're almost to the end. Let's see. Um, let me refresh a couple of things. Hmm. Okay. And like I said, if you have a question, oh, you know what I didn't do? I feel bad. Let me, let me hop out. I haven't been paying attention. Uh, I figured Amanda's probably loaded me up and I, with questions that I didn't look. Amanda, I'm looking right now. It says, the end. That's the name. The end. Phil, do you have any advice on making a volume pot have more drag? Well, you just, yeah. There's two, obviously, you know, if you're not going to buy a, 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 a more a heavy resistance uh, potentiometer, you know, something that has, you know, stiff, you can put a piece of rubber or, you know, I've seen, they actually make little rubber rings and stuff, but you can get little rubber uh, grommets and rings and stuff and stick them underneath there. And it just causes it to kind of like be a little harder to, to do. Um, I've uh, done it with a piece of foam too, by the way, you can kind of take a piece of foam, you cut it, you cut it like a donut in a circle, cut the hole, stick it on the, uh, the shaft and then stick the knob on there. And then it just makes it a little hard, uh, harder to, uh, t to turn. So a piece of foam, piece of rubber, any of that stuff that makes the knob a little bit harder to turn. And that's how you'll do it. Uh, Paul says, what was the lick you played during the Michael Kelly demo? Stuck in my head all day. Original work out cover. I'm a uh, novice, but I want to try and figure it out. So, you know, obviously I played a bunch of different licks, I'm assuming. Uh, but here's the good news. Um, almost all the licks I'm playing now are from stuff I wrote. So um, as you guys know, I took all the Tim Pierce stuff and I learned as much as I can. And I kind of took that philosophy that I learned from his courses Um you know, about not necessarily like, Hey, I'm going to be a great shredder, but like, how do I just, how do I take and make more music with what I have? And, um, I told you guys, my goal was, uh, I predict in the future, of course, with AI and all the things I, I do can do. One of the things I think I, AI is going to continue to do for YouTube is find copyright infringements, right? Just flag us for anything. So that three seconds of, of, you know, copyrighted material, I'll get, I'll get flagged. And, you know, there's no, nothing worse than when you have a video and you knock it out of the park on accident or, you know, and it's doing well. And then boom, they take your revenue because um, it's, you know, it's it's hard to get the ones that pay. The some Most of the videos don't pay a lot. So um, I started writing my own original stuff. Uh, it's not to be fancy. In fact, I wrote it in the concept of what would be good. I, what songs would I want to demo guitars on? I'm like, oh, I need a bluesy song. I need a, uh, a funky song. I need a, a metal song. I need a gent song. So I started writing songs in those veins just for demonstration purposes. And, um, and then the idea is that I can, you know, finish this EP kind of thing. And it's not so much to sell it, but then have it and then copyright and then say, you know, so, so that basically if I get a bot one day saying, Oh, you, you stole this from so-and-so I go, no, no, I have this. It's copyrighted. It's mine leave me alone. So, um, so that's what it is. Um, you know, 
I'd like to say I'd transcribe and stuff, but I don't see that happening anytime soon. I can't imagine anybody's going to give a crap. So, but I appreciate your compliment. So, you know, it makes me feel really super good because I've, I worked really, really hard. In fact, at detriment to the channel because I spent a lot of time focusing on that for a while, which really slowed down how many videos I was making. But I thought this was a better investment long term. Uh, ADV says, hey, Phil, do you still have and do you uh, use your love pedal joker no i got rid of the joker uh the boost pedal the joker i fell in love with that enhancer pedal and uh and then when i'm not using the enhancer pedal the pedal that i i like is the exotic uh clean boost uh gets me close and then of course i have a taurus servo pedal and those three boost pedals although i have a mic ramp and some other stuff those are the three boost pedals I use now. Um, the Love Pedal Joker is really cool, but it was kind of like one day I just started AB and things, and that was the one I didn't keep. Um, so, uh, Mr. Billinchar? Mr. Billinchar says, what stands are you using for your amps? I'm not using any stands for my amps. Uh, as, uh, you know, as you can see, they just sit on the floor now. Um, you can't, you can probably see one here in the corner. They sit In this room, they sit on the floor. In the other room, they're in racks. Uh, so they're in racks. Why? I have no idea. Just because it can, you know, having trouble paring down what amps I want to keep. So I can keep the most amount of amps if I keep them vertical. And, uh, even though I, you know, I only play a few all the time. Uh, Lee Asbury says, uh, Phil, hi, Phil. I oh, want to swap my neck pickup in my Vela, maybe something hotter and more dynamic. Do you know any pickups that will fit uh, fit in that pick guard as is? Any suggestions? Yeah, what you want is a mini pickup. Uh, you can get them from Seymour Duncan and from DiMarzio. They are direct fills. They will, they will fill in perfectly. Um, so let me show you so that we don't have to guess. Hold on a second. And like I said, you can get them from a ton, I mean, a ton of, ton of places. Uh, I'm going to take you to DiMarzio, but only because of I'm familiar with the um, the website. At least I think I, oh, there it is. Okay, here it is. These, any of these will work. Any of these will fit in the neck of your Vela. Um, and then you just kind of pick out what you want. Or like I said, any of these size pickups from Seymour Duncan or other brands too will work as well. And so, yep, that fits. Uh, the uh, Paul Ray Smith one looks a little like it's its own, you know, weird shape and it's not like anything else, but it is exact, exactly that shape. Um, I've swapped the Vela for someone. I swapped that pickup in that neck for in a Vela for someone and that's what I used. I actually used the DiMarzio and it went fine. Um, so... And even I was like you, I was like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. Let's see what I can fit. And then I was like, oh, this fits exactly. It uh, makes things easy. Okay. Here's Johnny says, Phil, any experience with nags? <laughs> I don't know. Here's Yes. The answer is yes. Uh, so I have two nags. Uh, I have a sovereign right there. You're looking at there. I'm pointing at a sovereign right here. This thing's gorgeous. Let me show it to you. This is one of those like, ooh, look at that. This is a, this is a, uh, I don't know what this is. This is a, the most expensive. Uh, they have, Sovereign says like a one, a two, and a three, I think. I don't know what, which one's the most, like one or two. This is the one. But watch, this one throws you off because see how the quilt on this? See how it's gorgeous, right? Okay. Ebony fretboard, ebony headstock, Evo frets. Look at that. But look at that neck. Yeah, that's a beautiful flame maple neck with an alder body. So that's gorgeous. So this is uh, this is like a two pickup version, two humbucker version. Uh, if you guys know my buddy Larry Mitchell, he has his own signature uh, nags, and his is based on this, but his is uh, single, 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 essentially. Um, and then... Here's the other nags. Look at that. Ooh, ah. So this is a single cut in white with, uh, I'm going to call it surf green. Beautiful. Look at that. Look at how they did that. So, um, so I'm a big fan of nags. Uh, love nags. 
uh, Joe Nags and Peter were on the channel. If you go to my second channel, Film Ignite 2, you can see some uh, interview podcasts. Everybody from John Petrucci to, uh, you know, uh, Mark Tremonti to Zach Wild to uh, Ola Strandberg uh, to Joe Nags and Peter Wolf. Uh, so there's a great Peter Wolf and Joe Nags interview on there. So <laughs> it's funny, you guys are gonna go. So, um, <laughs> you guys are like, I've never seen anybody pull a guitar off the green screen before. I know. Uh, let's see. Uh, yep, yep, says, hey, Phil, could you go over your thoughts on medium jumbo versus tall, thin frets? So to me, fret wire is, there isn't like a pass fail fret wire. It isn't like I only like jumbo and I don't like vintage fret wire or I only like medium jumbo and I don't like vintage tall. I don't think like that. Um, I've learned that some fret wire is better for me on certain neck radi or fretboard radiuses. So for instance, I like vintage tall um, or narrow tall fret wire on uh, strats. You know, because I like the, the the nine and a half inch radius. I like the th the the fret wire can be a little smaller. It's fine on a twelve inch radius fretboard. I tend to like the fret the frets to be on the thicker part of medium jumbo to jumbo fret wire. So also depends on the type of uh, the type of uh, fret wire too. Not just the how thick it is, but the type. So stainless steel. Um, I like medium jumbo over jumbo. Evo. I like jumbo. <laughs> Nickel. I like medium jumbo jumbo. So, I mean, I know that's not really an a definitive answer to your question, but I, cause I, you know, I know it's great if I could just say, this is the best fret wire, use this. But I've found that just there's, I tend to like certain fret wires, but I've learned, especially um, over the years with, you know, when you order guitars custom made, you really realize real fast, like if you just use the same fret wire on every guitar, it doesn't work for every guitar. Hey, Dr. Andre Floods here. He says, what was the vibrato on that nags? So Andre, uh, if you don't know, you should watch that interview um, with Joe that I did where he talks about it. Let me show you. So, so if you don't know, Andre, if you're not familiar, um, Joe Nags was, he ran the, the private stock at PRS. And then when he left the company with Peter Wolf, they started Nags Guitars. That's why they're down the road from Paul R. Smith. And this is a bridge that he kind of started working on. And it's on a hinge, like a door hinge. Let's see if I can get you closer. Okay, there you go. So it works like a door hinge. It is super cool, <laughs> right? It, it uh, the, the springiness on it has a, a very smooth feel because of the fact that it's not on a pivot point. So there's no two points of, you know, two points or six points. It's just literally on a hinge. There's like a pin, just like a, like I said, think of it like a door hinge. That's how he explained it. Um, so it's very unique. And I find it is one of the best tremolos I've ever played. The problem of course is it's exclusive to his guitars. So it's one of those like, um, you know what I would say if I, even though it's not the same design, in fact, far from it, I would say the closest feeling to it Vega trim, because they even though the Vega trim does rest on basically two points, you know where, it, but it also uses like a it feels like a hinge, so this feels a little bit more hingy. <laughs> I'm making up stuff now, um, but it's definitely got that that vibe. So like if I was if I was and I think on your channel I thought I saw you do a Vega trim. I know you uh, you did the Telly one. You didn't like it. I'm probably messing it up. Um, cause I remember thinking whatever they did on the first one, I, I think they fixed it since when you pointed out that it had problems, but, uh, I think you like the Vega trim. It, that's what this is basically like. It's like the Vega trim. Okay. Like that. Okay. Ah, oh, let's see. Um, oh, Jesse says podcast with Dr. Andre and Phil. I would do that. Uh, if you want to join me on a podcast, we could do it on my channel. I'd like to do it. Um, usually, I mean, we do it on your channel too, but usually the rule of thumb is uh, the channel with more subscribers. You want to do it on that channel because it exposes, you know, you get you get exposed to more viewers. That's usually the logic, but we could do it either way. 
I'd love to do it. I'd absolutely like to do it. Um, I'd like to do it like we're doing now, you know, let the viewers pick some subjects and topics and questions, and then we just hash it out, have some fun. <laughs> this has become like a show and tell thing. So we, okay, so what's the question? <laughs> this, is, this is the dark green guitar off your right shoulder. That's, it's, that's the next. Yeah. So we just talked about it. So, okay. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Andre, uh, Dr. Andre's up for it. Yeah, especially tremolos. Somebody said discussing tremolos would be fun. One of my favorite videos on tremolos, which we could knock off the idea, is Tim Pierce and uh, Pete Thorne. And um, they were the first time I realized they were talking. It's not even like a dedicated video. They were just talking in a video, the two of them at Tim's house. And they were talking about the feel of tremolos. You know, uh, the Bigsby versus the Floyd, you know, how it feels. And... You know, and it was the first time I ever seen anyone discuss it that it's not about just tuning accuracy. It can just be about feel. You know, to me, a Bigsby, Bigsby is like I always make the joke. It's like a Cadillac. It's like I'm just riding down the road. Like everything feels like this. And so you just don't want to go crazy on a Bigsby because you kind of feel like it's just the, the motion is too, too sweeping. And so I love talking about tremolo so i'll do no more talking so we can talk about it on a podcast because i think it'll be fun to talk about stuff like that especially you because i know um you know you're real sensitive to the guitar's intonation and i know you like to hold the tremolo at all times you know kind of use that that uh vibrato uh and uh that'd be really cool uh, Miserable Turd says, Babkiss tremolos all day long on my strats. What what say you? You know, Babkiss is, uh, I've tried one or two tremolos, Babkiss, and I remember loving them. It's It falls under that category of, you know, you just don't see them out in the wild too much. You know, there's, th the funny thing about tremolos is they, to me, I'd say, I would say tremolos, and potentiometers, I'm trying to think, of, probably the most fall into this one weird category where they don't pull, they don't pull in a purchase. What I mean by that is, you know, the manufacturers learn real fast that a pickup, especially a brand of pickup, and a tuning key, a brand of tuning key, can demand more price point. So it's kind of like that old joke, you know, like, hey, you, you know, uh, you know, investing in your house, you know, f a kitchens get more return than a swimming pool kind of thing. Right. Um, same logic for same logic for guitars, like, you know, putting good pickups. I'm talking about a manufacturer, not aftermarket, like a manufacturer puts quality branded pickups in their guitar or quality tuning keys. They could almost command double, triple what they have to pay for those pickups and tuning keys to the consumer and they get it. Where the tremolos and the potentiometers, that seems to be where they like to cut the most money um, because there just doesn't seem to be that huge draw. You know, no one goes like, oh, wow, this has, you know, a Babkiss or this has, uh, you know, a Vega trim or something like that. It's more of an expensive tremolo system, especially like think about those. Those fall into the category where, you know, you can find tremolos for fifteen dollars <laughs> you know what i mean it's, it's 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 tough it's a tough thing um to when a tremolo can be two hundred dollars the manufacturer wants to see not double their money on that but they want to see a, a hefty improvement in the cost of the guitar or the price of the guitar so they put a two hundred dollar tremolo in there or a hundred fifty dollar tremolo they want to see you know 150 they definitely want to see two 250 and it's two 200 they want to definitely see three 350 and so that becomes you know, tough. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, uh, Liquid Fret says, thumbs up to all the mods uh, for the great job. Yes, definitely. Thank you for the moderators. Uh, they're always hustling and working and dropping clicks and the links and, and uh, feeding me questions. Speaking of which, I'm going to do one right now, I think. Nope. Oh, there it is. See, I knew there was one. Um... Oh, I answered that one. <laughs> okay. I think we're almost done. I think we did it. I think we did a show this week. And we ended it on a positive note, which is good. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry I'm laughing. Uh, I love this question. Uh, Vox, Guitar, Vox Guitars Rock says, what's everybody paying for strings nowadays? I just thought that was funny. What a great... I hope you guys answer them. I don't know. I always buy mine in bulk. So, if I can, right? I try to. 
cut that cost down. I kind of strings to me are a necessary evil. You know, it's like, I know I'm going to need them. So if I can save a buck per pack buying in 10 packs or, you know, anything like that, I do, I do that. Um, so I buy my strings, uh, two ways. Um, I buy Daddario straight from Sweetwater. I used to do it from Mrs. Friend. I switched to Sweetwater. Uh, no particular reason. I don't, uh, Sweetwater wasn't giving me a better deal or anything. I just did it, did it. I think it's because I can get their stuff in a day now because they're in Glendale. And then, so I buy it in the 10 packs, you know, 10. And so you get a box of 10 packs of strings and not 10 individual packs. And then, uh, when I buy String Joy, um, same thing. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can get a bulk discount for buying a bunch. Um, so there, there. Hmm. Okay. All right. I think we covered all the subjects. I want to thank everybody for hanging out this Friday. Hope you guys have a great weekend. Uh, look forward. I, I look forward to the next couple of videos. I hope you guys check them out. Like I said, the SBS guitar, we're going to give away. We're going to be doing some more give guitar giveaways. A lot of the companies that are sending guitars out for the deep dives have agreed to do giveaways. Um, and, uh, and so I'll be announcing uh, giveaways more. That's good. I, I think they go over well. I think they're fun for us to do. I think they're fun for you guys. You know, you never know. It's, it's good. You never know. You might win it. The The reality is it's not that many people entering, so your odds are better than most sweepstakes. That's for sure. Okay. On that note, I want to thank you guys so much. Till next Friday. What are we out next Friday? Next Friday's episode is 353. So I will see you on next Friday's episode. The Know Your Gear podcast is not responsible for any spontaneous guitar purchases you make during